Our next speaker, David Pelly, like many of us, fell in love with northern Canada on a canoe trip in 1977. He wanted to find a reason to return and eventually found that writing assignments about the North gave him that excuse. The author of many books, he has written for Canadian Geographic, Parks Canada, and many other publications and organizations. His most recent book is Ukus Siksilak. I hope I said that right. The People's Story, which is for sale on the table over there. Perhaps the most interesting aspects of David's time in the North are the connections he has made with the people. In 1982, after a 50-day trip, 52-day trip on the Kazan River, he spent some time in Baker Lake. He writes in his biography, and I love this, at the end of that trip, everyone else with me had jobs or families to return to. I didn't. So I set up my tent in the middle of town, made some popcorn, and soon had many new friends. <laughs> One thing led to another in the way of small towns, and in particular the north. Having seen the archaeological on the banks of the Kazan, David now met the people So began his connections to Inuit with the culture. He will share his experiences of listening and recording Inuit stories. Please welcome David Pelly. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back uh, at the symposium, and uh, it's, it's not my first time. I think it's number four or five or something like that, and I always enjoy this audience, I must say. I open with this image because I love it, basically, and I, I like its meaning. It may appear to have next to nothing to do uh, with what I'm talking about today, but I think if you reflect on that later, you may understand that at a deeper level, it has everything to do with my various messages. And I'll just leave you with that uh, mystery to ponder later, if you wish. I have today's organizers a blessing to spend just the first couple of minutes, maybe three minutes of my allotted time telling you about a project to help Inuit youth. My wife, Lori, who's here with me today, and I established the Ayalik Fund because we believe in the self-developmental value of group experience for young people, and especially outdoor activities like canoeing and hiking that challenge youth and forge connections to the land. The sort of outdoor experience that we in this room all know and treasure, I'm sure. Just over a year ago, we lost our son, our only child. This is him. His English name is Eric. His Inuit name is Ayalik. We adopted him as a youngster. This gets a little difficult for me, but I'll, I'll get it, don't worry. As a youngster, when we were living in the high Arctic in Cambridge Bay. And his experience growing up uh, with us was in some ways similar to many other Canadian boys, but life also presented many challenges to Eric. I refer you to the recently released Truth and Reconciliation Commission report for detail. He faced these challenge, challenges, hugely helped by various outdoor programs and our own Barren Lands canoe trips. By the time he was 12 years old, he'd paddled on seven different Barren Lands rivers. International travel with uh, various 
uh, youth groups, and other activities which helped to develop his self-confidence and his self-esteem. And he became a fine young man. Suddenly, at the age of 19 and a half, in his sleep, at home, his heart failed without notice and without any warning, and he died. We were and are devastated by this, but we determined very quickly that we wanted to do something in Ayalik's name to help other Inuit youth, in part to give his short life added meaning, added value, by providing others with the opportunities that he had enjoyed. Many of you probably saw the difference that canoe trips and other challenging outdoor experience made to your own children. Ironic though it may seem, such opportunity is beyond reach for many young Inuit. So I'm asking for your help. Last year, the Ayalik Fund sent these two youngsters from Cambridge Bay, Eric's hometown. Ian on the right and Shania on the left, both 16, sent them on an outward bound experience in the Rocky Mountains. Neither one had ever been down south before. You can read their thoughts about their expedition on the Ayalik Fund website. In Ian's note to us after the trip, which you see on the screen here, he wrote, thank you so much for letting me go on this once in a lifetime opportunity. What I liked most was the climbing the mountain and river crossings. I came on the course to improve my leadership and to build my self-confidence. And on goes the story. Next summer, we plan to send four more youngsters from Cambridge Bay on an outward bound uh, canoe expedition in northern Ontario. And there are other programs in the works. Alex was good enough to suggest that we have a donation box. I hate to be crass, but there it is sitting on the table. And it occurred to me while I was sitting here waiting for my turn that if everybody in this room were to put the $20 bill in that box, we could send two more kids on an outward bound trip. It's worth thinking about. So please, please check it out. That's our website. It's also in your program. So now to my main subject and the reason I'm really here. Ukusiksalik, the traditional name of the area in the northwest corner of Hudson Bay. So this is Hudson Bay, obviously, and a Southampton Island. And this is Chesterfield Inlet, Baker Lake, where we just arrived a few minutes ago, okay, having come all the way across uh, from Yellowknife, which is a little tidbit on the side. Lori and I met on the Thelon River. And just up here in the corner is this fjord that goes in, which at one point the British thought was the beginning of the Northwest Passage. They were wrong. Uh, and that's in English called Wager Bay, named after a Brit, of course. But in English, I mean, it's already in the Inuktitut, this whole area is Ugus exotic. No one lives there today. But for Inuit of this general region, the west side of Hudson Bay, it has a, a special significance. Their ancestors often came to this area because they saw it as a land of plenty, a bountiful hunting ground where one could always find food. In difficult times, in times of hunger, people came from the north and the south and from inland to the west to find sustenance in Ukusiksalik. As a result, this is a landscape of stories. And that's what my new book, Ukusiksalik, is all about. The stories from the elders who are among the last people 
to live in Ukusiksarik. Let me make it clear right off the top that these people are the knowledge holders, the tradition bearers. This is, in reality, their book. I just happen to have the privilege of serving as the vehicle trusted to convey their stories to the wider world. Like you, I presume, when I think of the northern landscape through my own cultural lens, it is as a wonderful, vast wilderness, a place where we can seek grand adventure, experience a solitude and closeness to nature not readily available elsewhere in our lives. But I've come to realize that for Inuit, this land is a very different construct. It is home, it is the source of life, and it is therefore a landscape of stories. The book is full of their stories. Over the next few minutes, I'll give you just a small sample, in part to demonstrate the process and methodology that I used for collecting this material. So the story behind the book, if you like. For instance, in 1996, I spent a week camped with this woman and her family there, camped at the very, uh, right in the heart of Uku Siksarik, at the head of the fjord. Twinak, this wonderful woman, grew up at the old Hudson Bay Post that operated here from 1925, that's the year she was born, and it operated until 1945 when she was 20 years old. So her whole childhood revolved around this old Hudson Bay post. That's what it looks, looked like. Uh, actually, the picture was taken in 1996, so that's the occasion that I was there camped with them. It's deteriorated a little bit since, but the buildings are as she remembered them. And back in the, back in the day, this is actually taken in the 1930s, so it was during the height of, uh, of trading activity in Ukusiksalik. The building's really quite smart looking, and the supply ship uh, that, that you see there moored uh, had just arrived from uh, Chesterfield Inlet, which was the Hudson Bay uh, base, really, for the Western Hudson Bay, Hudson Bay Company base, and it would bring supplies in uh, once a year. Some of Tweenak's ancestors who worked around the post. She and her husband, during the week that we were camped there, shared a wealth of stories with me many of which are in the book, of course. Uh, they have both since passed away, as have all the elders that I interviewed in the 1990s for this book. In one long session, she recounted the tale of a multiple murder. I won't go into all the gory detail today. Of course, it's in the book. But suffice to say that it amply illustrates the harshness and sometimes brutality of survival on the land in the old days. A young man named Ayaruk was ordered to kill his father after the father had gone crazy and murdered four other relatives in their camp. The murder weapon in all cases was the same snow knife. It's a long and complex story which Twinak took many hours to recount. And then the next morning she said to me, I will show you where the murders took place. So we all walked for an hour across the tundra to an inconspicuous but really quite lovely spot beside a small river that flows into the lake where the Hudson Bay Post was. And this is that spot. She knew exactly where it was, although she had not been there for over 50 years. She sat on a rock, and she remembered the people and her ancestors and told bits of the story over again so that we could all hear it. Repetition, you should note, is a very important part of traditional Inuit storytelling. And just as we were about to leave this beautiful spot, although it's sort of a haunting place as well, 
the site of the murders, after all. We were about to head back to our camp, and one of Tweenak's daughters, a woman roughly my own age, cried out, Look what I found! She was bent down to the ground, but then she stood up and handed to her mother a snow knife. Exactly the same as the murder weapon. Make of this what you will. It's 100% true, I assure you. We don't know, of course, where, whose snow knife this was or how long it had been there, though certainly a very long time. But does that really matter? For all of us there that day, this was the confluence of myth and reality that is so often underlying traditional knowledge. It's a manifestation for me of the power of the oral history, a power that is beyond our understanding, really. Back in camp at the Hudson Bay Post that evening, sitting in our big tent, Tweenak leaned over toward me, put her hand on my arm and said in Inuktitut, I told you that story using the same words that Ayaruk said to his mother when he told her. It is not a legend. It is a true story. She was looking me right in the eye as she said that. This precise story now documented, was passed from Ayeruk to his mother, Uyaralak, who passed it on orally to her own daughter, Tuta, who in turn passed it to her daughter, Twinak. All of this orally. And Twinak then recorded it in 1996 at age 71 with uh, translation assistance, for my benefit, by her daughter, Manita. So how did all this oral history business uh, come to be and my work on Wager Bay? I first went there to Wager Bay, that is, in 1986. That's not important except to establish that it was quite a long time ago. That's 30 years, it's hard to believe. I was struck by the place, by the beauty of the landscape, I had interviewed friends with strong ties to the area, which led to my returning again and again during the following years, and thus to my becoming more aware of its fascinating history. In the early 1990s, when Parks Canada targeted the region for a new national park, I was asked to collect the oral history associated with Wager Bay. I worked on that initial project for three years, visiting all the surviving el elders at the time with connections to the area. They were spread around five communities on the west side of Hudson Bay. I visited them all multiple times, and those elders are the heart and soul of this project. The elders themselves are all gone. There are some members of the next generation still surviving. On a few occasions, we traveled together back to their old campsites on the shores of Wager Bay, triggering even more memories for them. This is Nanordluk, he has passed away some years ago, standing beside his family's old chamak. A chamak is a house made of rock and sod. And that's where he lived when he was a young man. A few details about collecting oral history. I hope that may be of interest to you. What's, what's important to know what, before you go into the process is to have a, a, a line of questioning ready that you're going to start with, but it's equally important to follow up on the tidbits that the informants offer. By way of example, this man, Amaruk, told me that his grandfather died while he was out hunting in Ukusiksalik. My ears perked up when he said that, of course, and I naturally followed up by asking, well, what happened? How did he die? And that resulted in a fascinating account, which he 
concluded, I won't read the whole account, again, of course, it's in the book, but he concluded by saying, quote, he was taken by evil spirits. People looked for him for a long time. There was nobody else in that area. My grandfather was an engaku, that's a shaman, an engaku. It looks like he was killed by another engaku's bad spirits. Amaruk and his uncle Chaput provided lots of detail for me on this mysterious event. In other words, it's all about listening, really. As a result, no two interviews follow the same course. Maps and photos often trigger good stories. It all goes on tape, or at least in the 1990s it was taped. Today it's digital. And it takes a professional translator, transcriber, about eight hours of work to process one hour of tape. Then you have to go back to the informant, usually more than once, to validate everything on the record, to invite changes or deletions and additions. That's an interesting process. Often when you start reading their own story back to them, they react with delight. One guy, listening carefully to his own account, said, wow, that's a good story. <laughs> Sometimes they interrupt, almost impatient to take over the storytelling again. And that too actually provides a degree of confirmation. They're comfortable with the way the story is unfolding, they recognize it. In fact, it's remarkable how consistent an informant like these old guys, how consistent they can be in telling and then subsequent retelling and again and again of the same story. The final result is more than just the transcription of a story. It is the reflection of the person, himself or herself, as a complete personality. There's often discussion about the ownership of traditional knowledge. In my experience with the many dozens of Inuit elders that I've helped to record their knowledge and their ancestors' stories, They've not been concerned about ownership. They simply want the material documented for future generations. They learn these stories orally at the knees of their grandmothers, and they don't want that rich tradition to be lost. What you have in this book, for example, is a wealth of story that would have been almost totally lost had it not, had it not been for Parks Canada's efforts to support the documentation process. <laughs> we have liftoff, Scotty. <laughs> Beam me up, okay? <laughs> so the, you know, the foresight of Parks Canada deserves huge credit, along with the gener generosity, the really the unselfish generosity of, of the elders who spent many hours, usually days, working with me to record their traditional knowledge. They were certainly not concerned about ownership or about the politics of it all or the possibility of future royalties. This work is their gift of love to future generations. They saw this process as an opportunity to bridge the gap between the world of the historic tradition that they had come out of to the world of their own grandchildren. Sometimes Inuit oral history can illuminate the well-documented accounts that we have in the historical record. Here, for example, is a map of the 1879 Schwatka expedition searching for clues to the uh, mysterious disappearance of the Franklin expedition some 30 years earlier. So uh, Schwatka sailed into Hudson Bay and whoops, and uh, you know established his base camp down here, which was basically where the whalers at the time were overwintering. Uh, 
between two seasons of, of uh, catching whales in Hudson Bay. And uh, you see the route he, he, he followed, so he went right across the end of Ukusiksik, uh, of Wager Bay itself, and through the heart of the Ukus, Ukusiksik uh, region, up to the Arctic coast, on to Joe Haven. This, of course, is the, uh, the shore where all the Franklin remnants have been found, and, uh, and then he came back. So, the point I want to make is not to tell you about the Schwatka expedition, but to underline the uh, value added by the Inuit oral history to the Schwatka story. Several of the informants to my work uh, in the Ukusiks Lake area had ancestors who had had contact with the Schwatka expedition. Nevertheless, not one of them knew the name Schwatka. But as a result, there are many stories in the oral history about the Schwatka expedition. Now, my favorite, uh, my favorite informant, uh, the informant who you've already met, of course, a couple of times, uh, Twinak here, she said to me, this is a quote, ships used to get lost up north, and people wanted to go look for them. I'm not really familiar with the people they were searching for on the lost ships and what they took and so on. You probably know their names. <laughs> This was her reference to Franklin, <laughs> a name with which Twinak was totally unfamiliar. Okay, so she didn't know the name Franklin, but she knew the names of all the Inuits that accompanied Schwatka. <laughs> and she knew who was related to who, and the, the, whole, the whole matrix of, of, uh, of the community at the time. Some of them were her ancestors. She told the story of their dog sled uh, travel through Ukusiksalik and across the high plateau to the north. On their way to the Arctic coast, she had detail of who they met along the way, whose camps they stayed in, what other Inuit they met, some friendly, some not so friendly, and uh, where they had found their food caches that the Inuit had put out ahead of time for Shwaka, and so on. Lots of detail that Schwatka or his uh, white colleagues on the expedition did not record in their accounts. So think about this for a minute. This woman who did not know the names of the missing explorers, the people they were searching for on the lost ships, she didn't know the names of any of the Hadanat, the, uh, the white guys on the uh, Schwatka expedition itself, or she didn't know where they'd come from. She had no idea what country they were from. But she could tell us more about the route and the travel conditions and who they met and what happened to them during the expedition than Schwatka had recorded in his own historical record. This surely illuminates the uh, power of oral history. Of the actual search for Franklin clues, here's some of what she said. I like this quote. The person named Henry walked all over the place looking for something somewhere along the coast near Joe Haven. So Joe Haven is the closest present-day community to where the Franklin ships uh, are on the sea bottom. Somewhere along that coast, he found a grave. Apparently, someone made a cairn in the Nuxuk beside the grave and put papers in among the rocks. Henry found them. And when he found the papers, they said that the doctor of the ship had died from sickness. So that little piece of white history had come down in the Inuit oral history. It was sort of interesting to me that she had that one detail. Henry and the others walked around searching all the time, and he also found some coins that were stashed away. When he found the grave with the letters and the money, the others could hear him shouting from far away because he was so happy. The letters and the money were contained in the same bag. They also found a human shoulder bone in a pot. They couldn't figure out whether it was the skeletal remains of a person that died from hunger or whether the guy was murdered. And they didn't find any other letter saying how he died. My grandfather, whose name was uh, Maliki, who was one of the people accompanying Schwatka, walked and searched around with them. They did not find a lost ship, but they found a grave with letters and money. So I, I think you can agree that this is a significant addition to the historical record left by Schwatka. 
But just stop and think for a minute. This account was passed down orally from her grandmother to her mother and then down to Tweenak herself, who told it to me with uh, her daughter interpreting. And we can be absolutely certain that it is full of accurate detail. By the way, Schwatka and his colleagues documented information given to them by local Inuit along the Arctic coast, which at that time, 1879, pinpointed the location of where the Erebus, HMS Erebus, Franklin ship, was found, found two years ago. The Inuit had already told Schwatka exactly where it was. And how did they know this? They've been telling, well, I should actually say that uh, Inuit in that area have uh, been telling people collecting oral history like myself and been telling uh, the federal, uh, federal government search parties where they should be looking for years. They've been telling this, but people have not been listening. And in fact, uh, Inuit were responsible for the ship Erebus sinking uh, in that location because when they first found the ship uh, frozen in ice, probably in the 1850s, so just a few years after Franken had abandoned it, there was no sign of life on board. So they made a hole through the ship's side, just at the level where they were standing on the sea ice. That's how they got inside and they discovered various bits and pieces and dead bodies and so on, but there was no one alive. So, of course, the next summer when the ice melted, there was a hole right at the water line, the ship sank. Much to their disappointment because it was a good source of wood. <laughs> but the result that's significant is that that story passed down in the oral history. It was still very actively told uh, when I first arrived there and, uh, and they knew exactly where this location was. So, the power of oral history. I think it's evident. This is how stories from the land have been transmitted through the generations for centuries. In the final analysis, here's, here's what I make of it. The land is more than empty tundra, beautiful though that is. The landscape is a matrix of old trails and travel routes and all that that represents to Inuit survival. The spirits of the people who traveled there on this land remained a fundamental part today of that landscape. And their stories are woven into this complex tapestries, dimensions of time and place. The Inuit elders at the centerpiece of this tableau were the very embodiment of these ideas, these notions that I just listed. They were the knowledge holders. They understood the importance of Inuit traditional knowledge, not only in the existential Inuit Kaujimayatuganit sense as a way of seeing the world, but equally in the value of the old stories as a reflection of where they had come from and who they were. This is their book. These are their voices. This is their legacy. Thank you very much.